summer 2001, an international team assembles in Russia's Barents Sea to attempt the most difficult operation in the history of ocean salvage. The mission, to raise a Russian nuclear submarine, the Kursk, victim of a violent disaster. An explosion that plunged a submarine almost two football fields long to the bottom of the sea. How this could have happened is a mystery that raising the sub may solve. Nothing like it has ever been attempted. To succeed, salvagers must summon a network of ships, divers, and the heaviest ocean lifting equipment in the world in their quest to raise the Kursk. The Barents Sea, far in the Russian north, is one of the harshest oceans on the planet. The Barents is hospitable for only a few short months each summer. By September, it's a frothing fury. On September 26th, when ocean salvagers aboard a massive barge arrive to lift the sunken submarine Kursk, they fear that they are too late. A twisting road has led to this dramatic day. For those who will attempt to raise the Kursk, it is now a battle against nature and time. The Kursk's story begins a year earlier. August 10th, 2000. Dawn, the barren sea above the Arctic Circle. In a restricted harbor, the nuclear submarine Kursk prepares for the largest war game in her six years of service. This place once symbolized terror to Western navies. It was home to the Soviet Union's fleet of 120 nuclear submarines. Now only 40 remain. The Kursk is among the newest and fastest. Two nuclear reactors give her a submerged speed of 28 knots. The Kursk carries a crew of 118 men. They are young and sharp, the finest crew in the fleet. In an era of decline in the Russian military, these men are proud. The Kursk symbolizes the future. The Kursk is an Oscar II class submarine, the largest attack sub ever built. Oh, it's huge. It's over 500 feet long, uh, about 505 feet long. The Washington Monument, by comparison, is 555 feet high. It's taller than the Statue of Liberty is high. At 24,000 tons, the Kursk is over three times the size of her U.S. counterparts. Double-hulled, she is built to withstand a direct hit from an enemy torpedo. Her designers consider her virtually indestructible. On August 10, 2000, the Kursk takes part in the largest Russian naval exercise in a decade. The entire Russian northern fleet is out in force, testing equipment and weapons in a way not seen since the height of the Cold War. American and British spy subs are in the area with orders to learn about this unusual show of force.
The Kursk's role in the war game is to hunt down the missile cruiser Peter the Great. She fires an unarmed missile, a supersonic weapon codenamed Shipwreck. The Kursk was built to attack the United States Navy. The Oscar-class submarines were designed to sink U.S. carriers. They were designed to trail U.S. carrier battle groups in the event of a war to fire their missiles and kill the carrier before the carrier could kill some of their ships. One month before this mission, Captain Lieutenant Dmitry Kolesnikov brings his new bride Olga aboard to show her the Kursk. For Olga, the state-of-the-art sub is a compelling rival for her husband's affections. I was insanely jealous of that lady because I knew he loved her. At times, I couldn't even tell which of us he loved more, me or her. Dima told me many times that he would come to no harm for as long as he served on the Kursk. That's why, when he left port, I wasn't worried. I knew that woman would protect him and take good care of him. She wouldn't let anything happen to him. August 12, 2000. The Kursk is scheduled to fire a practice torpedo. The fleet waits. The shot is never fired. At 11.29 a.m., the Kursk explodes and plunges over 300 feet down. The missile cruiser Peter the Great scours the area with sonar in a desperate race to rescue anyone who may have survived. Finally, after a day and a half, the Kursk is discovered. A buoy marks the location of the stricken submarine. If there are men alive on the Kursk, the near freezing temperature and limited oxygen offer only a few precious days survival. Still, Russia declines all offers for help. August 20th, eight days since the Kursk sank, Russia's rescue operation has failed. Divers from Norway are finally permitted to the disaster site. A diver hammers on the hull. There is no response. A robotic vehicle opens the rear escape hatch. Only a final burst of air. One hundred eighteen men are dead. Those who survived the explosion must have died a horrible, slow death. It's like Dante's Inferno. I mean, it's like going to hell. I mean, those poor guys are stuck in a sunken ship with limited air supply, um, waiting to die. The divers also discover that the submarine's bow is severely damaged. The mystery behind what sank the Kursk lies somewhere in this twisted forward section of the submarine. <laughs> Families of those lost on the Kursk seek answers. None more so than one mother, Nadezda Tilik. So then I screamed at them to tear off their own epaulets.
because I think such people don't deserve to be in the military. They had murdered our kids, our near and dear. When a nurse sedates Tilik, it is a public relations catastrophe. Russian President Vladimir Putin steps in. He vows to raise the Kursk. His pledge sends a message of hope and strength. The operation will cost 130 million US dollars, but Russia believes it must be done. There are several reasons for this. The first, most important one, is that we need all the information on the disaster that we can get. The other reason, no less important, is to get this huge hazardous object, a nuclear object, out of the area of the Barents Sea, which is characterized by heavy traffic. These are the two reasons that make the raising of the Kursk necessary. In May 2001, the Dutch company Mammut signs a contract to raise the Kursk by September. Mammut is a world leader in heavy lifting and transport. It is a very complicated job eh, because you have uh, nuclear aspects. You are working on a an, on depth of uh, 180 meters. Uh, you have a very, very special uh, equipment to, to do the lifting. Uh, so it is uh, for our company, uh, it is really, uh, really a milestone to do this job. Mammut brings in the Rotterdam company Smith International as a partner. Together, they will tackle the most complex ocean salvage operation in history. The salvagers devise a plan. An enormous barge called the Giant Four will be anchored over the Kursk. 26 cables will be lowered from the giant and attached to the submarine. Each one will be fitted into a hole cut by divers into the sub's hull. The sub will be lifted from the bottom and secured under the barge. The Kursk will then be towed to a dry dock 110 miles away, near the Russian city of Murmansk. theory pales against practice. If they succeed, the Kursk will be the heaviest vessel ever lifted from the ocean floor. No ship, to my knowledge, this large has ever been salvaged from about 300 feet. Something displacing over 20,000 tons, I don't think we've ever undertaken anything of this size or complexity. The Kursk's two nuclear reactors are shut down, but the sub contains dozens of missiles and torpedoes. A weapons explosion could unleash a nuclear disaster. I don't say there is no risk. There is always a risk in this type of operations, but you make your assessments in such a way that you eliminate uh, all the events and you, lim and you limit your risks in that respect. But there is always a risk. The countdown begins. The salvagers have just four months before Arctic weather prevents them from raising the Kursk. July 2001. In Amsterdam, the Netherlands, an enormous barge undergoes its most unusual refit in over 20 years of service. She is the giant four. At 24,000 tons and 450 feet long, the giant's purpose is to transport heavy objects for the oil industry. 
even entire rigs. Certainly, she has never lifted a nuclear submarine from the ocean floor. The barge is custom fitted for each job. For the Kursk, the Giant is outfitted with 26 lifting jacks. Each jack has been tested to 900 tons. A bundle of 54 cables extends from each jack, which will be lowered to the Kursk. During experiments in a Russian laboratory, the cables prove stronger than the steel plugs that will marry them to the Kursk. To keep the barge stable over the sub, the lifting jacks have a hydraulic system much like a car's suspension to counteract wave action of up to eight feet. So what we have to do is to create a suspension system based on a gas cylinders that takes out the action of the waves, which then takes all the forces and the load from the waves, but does not affect the lifting units. The giant undergoes another critical modification. A massive hole is cut into her hull in order to accommodate the Kursk's conning tower once the sub and the barge are married. The bottom of the barge is partly opened up, one part to, to to, uh, to have the, the, the plane, say the command tower of the submarine to will go into the structure of the barge. And underneath the barge we have make kind of saddles which are, are covered with wood. And those saddles, they have the same curve as the outer hull of the submarine. Modifications on the Giant continue 24 hours a day to meet the September deadline. On July 16th, in the Barents Sea, another ship begins the first phase of the operation over the wreck of the Kursk. She is the Mayo, 270 feet long. The Mayo is the dive support vessel for the men with the most perilous job in the entire Kursk operation. A rotating crew of 12 divers and 70 support staff are aboard. The Mayo contains a saturation diving system. In order to give divers maximum time underwater, they live for four weeks in a tiny steel cylinder, their bodies pressurized to the depth of the Kursk. They are unable to leave the chamber during their month-long job. It could kill them if they did. The living chamber connects with a diving bell so that the divers can transfer from one to another without depressurizing. So when this bell is mated onto here, you've got a sequence of doors that have to be opened and closed for the diver to pass from the living quarters actually into the diving bell, and then this has to be parted from the living system and then tracked out over to the moon pool and dropped down to their working depth to carry out their work. Tether connects the divers to the bell, delivering them air, light, and hot water to heat their suits, as the sea temperature is barely above freezing. Two divers work at all times, while another monitors them from the bell. 300 feet down, their first task is to clear the hull of debris and silt. It's dangerous and gruesome work. The Kursk is a tomb for the remains of over a hundred men. She also contains unexploded weapons and two nuclear reactors. The divers are on constant alert for radiation leaks.
Their most critical job is to cut 26 holes in the Kursk's hull to attach the lifting cables. To do this, the divers use an abrasive water jet system. Shooting from a nozzle at up to 22,000 pounds per square inch, the water and grit combination can cut through the Kursk's steel hull like a laser. For the diver's safety, the mayo must remain exactly in place over the Kursk. What the ship does is we've got three bow thrusters for it and we've got two azimuth thrusters aft. And what he's doing is instructing the computer to actually move. So it's got a GPS position where it knows where it is and it's now going to move 10 meters in the direction to that new position and it will then sit on that position and you can move the ship any which way, whatever you want. The divers rotate around the clock in six-hour shifts. After each descent, they return to their cramped, compressed home. Cutting the hull turns out to be a much more difficult operation than expected. The Kursk is covered by six inches of rubber, a noise reducer. The precise high-pressure jet merely mangles this rubber layer. After two weeks' work, just two of 26 holes are cut. There is no time for the setback. As the divers labor on the hull of the Kursk, they report that the bow is severely damaged. Few things could cause such destruction. Many in the Russian Navy believe that an American spy submarine collided with the Kursk. I think that as the submarine Kursk was working on its mission in the Northern Fleet's testing areas, it was kept under surveillance by foreign submarines. I am not pointing any fingers here. It isn't relevant whether these were US or British or some other submarines. There have been dozens of submarine collisions, most in Russia's Barents Sea, Captain Sergei Bulgakov experienced one of the most recent. In March 1993, I was on active duty. On March 20th, the collision occurred. As we found out later, we collided with the U.S. submarine Grayling. It happened in the Barents Sea. The U.S. Navy has been operating up there for quite a while, keeping an eye on the Soviet Navy, really to see, yeah, see how they operate and what their capabilities were, so in the event of a war, we'd be able to handle them a lot more easily. Three NATO submarines were in the area spying on the Russian naval operation when the Kursk sank. But the United States denies that one of its submarines collided with the Kursk. I don't think the American submarine would have, one, made it back, two, if it made it back, would have probably done so on the surface, and three, with 130 people on the American attack submarine, we'd know by now. The Russian Navy continues to search for clues. A telltale scrape, maybe some parts from a NATO sub. So far, they find no evidence. The Navy now guards the Kursk site from any other unwelcome intruders. The missile cruiser Peter the Great keeps constant vigil, warding off NATO ships and submarines. Spy ships circle the area, this one Norwegian, inquisitive about the unique salvage operation. Out of sight below the sea, divers continue their morbid work on a steel tomb. 
resting place for the remains of more than a hundred men. And on the first anniversary of the sub's loss, at a service in St. Petersburg, the morning has still only just begun. Twelve corpses were removed by divers from the submarine in October 2000. One of them was Dmitry Kolesnikov. On his body, a note wrapped in plastic. Final words to his wife of four months, Olga. I love you. Don't be too upset. I can't see my own writing in the dark but I'll try writing nevertheless. It looks like we don't have much chance, 10 or 20 percent at best. Let's hope someone will read this. Here is the list of names of all compartment personnel who are at present in compartment 9 and are going to try to break out. Love to everyone. Do not despair. Kolesnikov. Kolesnikov's note says he was trapped in the very rear of the submarine with 22 other men. He writes two hours after the explosion, at 1.15 p.m. and again at 3.45, proof that he and several others spent their final hours in icy darkness, waiting for a rescue that would never come. I don't know where Dima found the power. I don't know where Dima found the strength to write those amazing words. One year to the day since the Kursk sank, the people of St. Petersburg pay tribute to the loss of the crew. Many must have died instantly, but others like Dmitry Kolesnikov lived a few harrowing hours longer, ultimately running out of oxygen and time. For the families, raising the Kursk has a personal meaning. It will bring their dead home. When the Kursk sank in August 2000, the sound was detected by scientists in nearby Norway. They recorded two noises just over two minutes apart. The first, small. The next, 3.5 on the Richter scale. Comparable to a small earthquake. But one thing was unusual. The explosions were eerily similar. We compared them and uh, they were very, very close in terms of the uh, seismic signal. Uh, talking about the character of the event now, of course the size was uh, vastly different. The, the first one was very small and was barely detected, even, as, even at the closest station. The acoustic evidence provides clues to what happened when the Kursk sank. August 12, 2000. As part of a war game, Kursk is ordered to fire a practice torpedo. At 8.51 a.m., the Kursk's captain radios for confirmation. The missile cruiser Peter the Great moves 30 miles off and waits. Two and a half hours later, a small explosion from below. The captain does not surface the sub. The Kursk must be severely flooding. 134 seconds later, a devastating blast.
The sound indicates that the first explosion was a single torpedo. The torpedo contains a tank of fuel propellant. On typical Russian torpedoes, that fuel is hydrogen peroxide. Heated hydrogen peroxide in contact with certain metal surfaces is known to explode. If a fire had started, the hydrogen peroxide heated, and if the crew failed to eject it overboard, an explosion was inevitable. That fire then, a couple of minutes later, spread to one or two other torpedoes lying alongside this one, uh, and that then detonated the warheads which just tore open the bow of the submarine. The second explosion would have killed everyone in the forward half of the submarine in less than a minute. But what triggered the first explosion remains an unsolved mystery. August 14, 2001. 300 feet below the vessel Mayo, divers labor against the Kursk's tough outer hull. After four weeks, only 11 of 26 holes have been cut in the submarine. They had expected to be finished this first phase by now, and winter weather is just one month away. Despite the setback, phase two is set in motion. 200 miles west in Kirkness, Norway, a barge carrying a revolutionary cutting saw arrives from Holland. The salvagers fear pieces of the damaged bow may fall off during the lift they have decided to remove 60 feet from the front of the submarine. But many believe the Russians have their own motives for this surgery. It will leave clues to what sank the sub at the bottom of the Barents Sea. I think the only hard evidence, if it exists at all, is in the forward torpedo room. And again, that's the section they're leaving on the ocean floor but they've lost a chance to have technicians, forensic scientists, if you will, go over that forward torpedo room once it was on the surface. The saw is a cable, encrusted in sharp steel cutting bushings. It has been tested on an old hulk, similar in strength to the hull of the Kursk. But until the divers complete cutting the holes, the saw barge will wait in Norway, a delay the operation cannot afford. A hundred and ten miles south of the site, the largest dry dock in Russia awaits the Kursk. But the dry dock is too shallow to accommodate the barge giant with the submarine harnessed beneath. The solution lies in Severodvinsk, in the Russian north, at the Sevmash shipyard. Sevmash has the job of building pontoons for the final critical part of the lift. Ironically, this shipyard also built the Kursk 10 years earlier. The huge submersible pontoons will lift the giant fully out of the water and escort the barge subcombination into the dry dock. The construction of the 300-foot-long pontoons in just three months is the fastest large-scale operation in the history of shipbuilding. August 21st, 2001. Salvagers get their first taste of winter. All operations cease. September will be much worse. After three days of ferocious seas, work resumes on the wreck of the Kursk. But the salvagers now officially admit the technical problems have delayed the lift by a week. 
Now the divers proceed at a furious pace. Over the next two days, 10 holes are cut. Finally, on August 28th, the last of 26 holes is finished. The first phase is complete. Now the salvage ships mobilize in a synchronized plan. The saw barge leaves Norway. 1,600 miles away in Amsterdam, the giant gets underway. Towed at just five miles an hour, the giant will reach the Kursk in two weeks. After two months of successes and delays, the greatest challenges are still ahead. August 30th, 2001. The cutting saw designed to sever 60 feet off the mangled bow of the Kursk arrives at the site. The humble rusting barge is flagship of this dangerous phase of the operation. The saw must be placed exactly to avoid explosive impact with the sub's forward missiles or with torpedoes in the devastated bow. Two 40-foot high anchors designed to burrow their way into the seabed will keep tension on the saw. They are lowered and then positioned on either side of the Kursk's bow, an operation that takes four precious days. The saw chain, with its steel bushings, stretches over the top of the Kursk's hull. On September 4th, the cutting begins. Diving operations halt, fearing lethal contact with the saw. The chain slices through the Kursk at an amazing speed. The operation was expected to take days. 25% of the cutting is complete after just two hours. Then a setback. The saw breaks loose from the anchors. Working around the clock, it takes a full two days to reattach the saw. After another day's work, good progress. Only 20% of the Kursk's hull remains to be cut. But the saw now digs into the seabed and breaks again and again. The delay costs another three days. Now the giant completes her 1600 mile voyage. She arrives in nearby Kirkness, Norway and is instructed to wait there. If the bow is not removed, the giant will never get her chance to lift the Kursk. On September 11th, the terrorist event that shakes the United States reaches the distant Barents Sea. Russia joins the world in mourning. But the operation does not pause. Divers continue to grapple with the saw. On September 14th, the final few inches of the Kursk steel hull are severed. Now, another frenetic week passes as teams of divers clear debris from the holes in the Kursk's hull to install the lifting cables. On September 26th, the giant arrives from Norway and anchors in position over the Kursk. But the giant may be too late. The deadline to lift the Kursk has passed. From now on, the weather will be the salvager's worst enemy.
From mid-September on, you're not going to be able to pull off a salvage operation. From mid-September, probably to March, because of heavy weather. Just then, the worst storm of the season lashes the Barents Sea. The Giants captain, Pete Sink, calls his shore team to consider the options. Anchored, he runs the risk of facing the storm broadside, putting the barge in jeopardy. But to leave for shelter would delay the lift even further. Sink and his team decide to ride it out. For two days, the giant is battered by wind and sea. The weather breaks at last, but the lift operation needs at least four days of calm seas to succeed. In nearby Murmansk, project chief Franz van Sumeren makes a grim statement. Of course, uh it is so that the forecast for tomorrow is not good because there's a lot of swell with a northeast wind and probably we cannot do a lot tomorrow. Uh, Thursday, Friday is, is by the weather not possible anymore. But they have come too far to give up now. The next stage of the operation proceeds. Four cables from each lifting jack guide heavy steel plugs called grippers down to the submarine. The grippers secure each of the 26 lifting bundles to the holes in the submarine. They expand and lock in position. Now the giant is married to the Kursk. After four months, all of the intricate pieces of the operation are finally in place. The weather must hold. The lifting jacks can only compensate for waves of up to eight feet. If the waves get any higher, the sub will be disconnected and the lift called off, maybe forever. Three thirty a.m., October eighth, two thousand and one. In calm seas and biting Arctic air, the time has come at last to attempt to raise the Kursk. Divers are cleared from the site. If even a single cable breaks, the recoil could kill. Okay, Malcolm. We starting with uh, lifting. We put on the back side. Uh, 700 tons, yeah? Okay. Jan van Sumeren is in charge on the giant. Yeah, yeah, that's okay to start tensing up on the aft section now. The Kursk is embedded in the ocean floor, making an exact lifting calculation impossible. The system can handle 18,000 tons lifting power. The salvagers begin with 4,000 tons about halfway divided between bow and stern. Computers show the weights supported by each jack and indicate how each hydraulic compensator counteracts the motion of the sea. Power is increased to 7,000 tons. Miraculously, suction from the seabed offers no resistance.
At 9,600 tons, the Kursk rises off the ocean floor. The Kursk is the heaviest object ever lifted from the bottom of the sea. At 5.30 p.m., she fits snugly under the giant. It is a technological victory that has never been equaled in the history of ocean salvage. Over a year since her catastrophic loss, the Kursk and her entombed crew are going home. It takes two days for the giant and her tragic cargo to reach the dry dock, 110 miles south near Murmansk. Another technical challenge awaits. The Navy dry dock is too shallow, so pontoons must lift the giant and the Kursk. The Russian-built pontoons are designed to lock onto the giant's hull, but problems plague this seemingly simple plan. The operation takes 12 days, but in the sheltered bay, Arctic storms no longer pose any threat. It is mid-October, a full month later than scheduled. Finally, the pontoons lock onto the giant. Water is pumped from the pontoons, lifting the barge fully out of the water. The Kursk emerges beneath the giant. Russian Navy experts will spend months combing the sub for clues to what sank her. They find parts of the front of the sub embedded deep in her middle, terrifying proof of a massive torpedo explosion. Experts estimate that a blast equivalent to five tons of TNT ripped through the sub's steel hull but they can find no proof if the explosion was caused by a collision or by human error inside the Kursk. On October 21st, 2001, the Russian Navy eases the barge cradling their shattered submarine into the dry dock. Underneath the giant, the lifting cables are lowered and the grippers retracted. Two days later, salvage ship and submarine finally part. The Kursk's conning tower appears in the Arctic air. The submarine's fate is to be scrapped at a cost of 10 million US dollars. A United States Congress nuclear safety fund will pay for her destruction. Deep inside the Kursk, there is one final gruesome task, the search for human remains. Of 118 men lost, 82 bodies are recovered. Most can be identified, evidence that they may not all have been killed in the blast. Several may have died hours later, trapped in darkness, knee deep in icy water, when oxygen finally ran out. The image haunts Olga Kolesnikov. The final terrible moments of her husband, Dmitri, stranded in the submarine. Mm -hmm. 
I'm still waiting for him to come back. I'm waiting for him all the time. With my mind, I understand that I must accept this tragedy as an accomplished fact. But my heart refuses to believe it. At the bottom of the Barents Sea, divers place a memorial where the curse was lost. A permanent tribute to the catastrophe and to the triumph of those who raised her from the unforgiving sea.